Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Smart Human Podcast. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Marvin Singh, an old friend who happens to be a functional medicine trained, integrative medicine trained gastroenterologist, which is incredibly rare. He's going to talk with us about how our gut affects our mental health, our immune system, and how nutrition can bolster the gut and the gut microbiome, as well as chemicals in the gut probiotics, what you need to know and what they are and how to pick them, as well as COVID-19 and all of the effects that COVID-19 may have on the gastrointestinal tract. So stay tuned, sit back and enjoy this really wonderful interview with Dr. Marvin Singh. Welcome, my old friend and continuing friend, uh, Dr. Marvin Singh, uh, integrative, functional uh, gastroenterologist out in uh, California. So it's so good to see you. We're old friends. And why don't you share with the audience, uh, the Smart Human Podcast audience, how we met? Yeah, we met, I don't know, it was three years ago now? I, th uh, I can't remember exactly, but um, we I was just in the middle of my, uh, just ramping up my integrative medicine uh, practice, and um, I was invited to write a book chapter for you in your integrative environmental medicine book. And I remember thinking, I don't know how I'm going to write this book, chemicals in the gut and the microbiome? I don't know. Is there is there such a thing? And I think that uh, that thing of writing that book chapter really changed me and my perspective a lot. I mean, I think that was probably one of the most influential things that I did was actually being invited to write that book chapter because it made me realize that there is so much out there that we that that we have information on that a lot of people don't even pay attention to or know, and there are a ton of environmental factors that you know, impact the gut and the microbiome and, and can affect our health. And now this is one of my favorite topics to even, you know, speak about. <laughs> well, you, well, you did a great job. I mean, that was, uh, I, yeah, I think it, the book came out as part of the series, the Dr. Andrew, the Dr. Andrew Weil series through Oxford. Um, there's integrative, you know, women's health, integrative men's health, integrative cardiology, pediatrics. Um, and then this was the integrative environmental medicine book. And, um, and I thought that the gut at the time, I mean, I was a little bit more of a novice as well. And I didn't really know how much of an influence environment had on the gut, gut microbiome. Um, and you just knocked it out of the park. So I thought that was a really great chapter and it really was eye-opening for me. Um, so that was exciting. And then you went on to do as well, um, you were asked to do the integrative gastroenterology um, second edition for the series, which is a huge thing. And, um, and how did that go? That was just, just came out last fall, correct? Yeah, that came out in October, 2019. And um, that was a major undertaking. We basically rewrote the textbook of uh, integrative gastroenterology and um, also very educational and fun process um, uh, by which we did all that and learned a lot, got to interact with a lot of cool people. I think that's probably one of the coolest parts about uh, being an editor of one of these major books. I don't know if you agree, but you get to meet so many cool people and um, learn from them and see how they write. And, and uh, it's really an awesome collaborative effort. Yeah, no, I think it's, it, it's eye opening. And it was, it was quite a challenge considering that textbook was the first thing I ever really put together professionally. So, um, so that's really awesome. So let's get kind of get into some of the stuff, all your, your knowledge about the gut microbiome. So for our audience, why don't you let us know, you know, what, what is the power of the gut? What is it made up of? Give us like sort of the, you know, the GI microbiome discussion 101. Um, and introduce us, because I'm sure you have a lot of, you know, patients at your clinic out West and uh, telemedicine that really don't quite understand or know about this. Yeah. So the gut, uh, when we say the gut, we're often referring to the microbiome, which is in the gut, but the, the gut is the digestive tract. So that's where, you know, where we eat and our food goes and gets processed and digested. And um, this is a very important organ, really, because um, it's the seat of the immune system. There are, you know, 70% of our immune system is in the gut. And what we mean by that is that the microbiome is part of this as well. And the microbiome is 
trillions and trillions of bacteria that live inside of our gut. There are also viruses and fungi, so it's not just bacteria. And, you know, if you were to lump them all up into a ball, it would be about three and a half, four and a half pounds. And that is, uh, oh, that's about as much as the human brain weighs. So just to kind of put it into perspective for you, it's a, it's a pretty decent size uh, organ system. And these microbes really do a lot of things. They produce hormones, they produce neurotransmitters and chemicals, and the, the digestive tract has its own uh, nervous system called the enteric nervous system that also, you know, uh, uh, is used as a communication forum to talk with the rest of the body as well. And um, uh, it's really uh, an incredible thing when you really look into all the aspects of the gut uh, and digestion. It's not just where you eat and where you poop. There's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> yeah, no, this is all great. And I try to tell my patients, you know, you're sitting in a room that's what, 10 by nine. And I say, you know, our GI tract is basically 20 to 24 feet of bowel. I mean, it's two of the size of this room. And all of a sudden their eyes open up, you know, and I'm trying to give them sort of like, you know, it's just a monstrosity, but it's just so key. And speaking of the immune system, since I'm an autoimmune disease doctor, you know, I try to connect why people may have developed or could develop rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, Crohn's, all these autoimmune issues. And and maybe you can tell us a little bit of, you know, and simplistically how how the gut plays into the immune system in terms of the mechanics of the gut. Well, uh, the the gut uh, really can control the inflammation in our body, and really that's one of the key concepts when we're talking about chronic diseases and autoimmunity. And uh, what we mean by that is that we have an intestinal barrier, uh, which means our, our lining of our digestive tract. And it's really, you would think that, you know, if, if 70% of our immune system is there, then we'd have like a, you know, a fortress of a, of a barrier there, but it's really not. It's one cell layer thick. And uh, these cells um, are joined by these protein complexes called tight junctions. And you can kind of think of them as like little drawbridges between, you know, uh, two little buildings. Um, uh, if you're looking at just two cells, and that goes all the way along the digestive tract. And when there's a problem with one of these tight junctions or several of these tight junctions, um, meaning that there's an injury or um, some a defect, uh, which could be caused by a number of things, it could be caused by stress, could be caused by toxins, could be caused by bad diet, could be caused by poor sleep, could be caused by all of those things. Um, because a lot of times, um, sometimes people have all of those kind of issues going on. Then we have a problem because things that are supposed to stay in the digestive tract they leak out into the circulation, into the bloodstream. This is what we mean by leaky gut or intestinal permeability. They cross but, the tube into the bloodstream, that tube of 24 feet. Yeah. yeah. And then when that happens, then um, then all of your kind of conditions that you follow happen. So the, the immune system starts saying, hey, what is this? And starts, you know, uh, mounting attacks uh, against these various different uh, compounds, chemicals, foods, particles. And, you know, depending on the nature of the exact issue or where it settles in, um, that's when um, you may have a particular problem. If if you have some of these uh, microbes that are in the gut kind of translocate to perhaps the skin, could cause a disruption in the skin microbiome, um, which could uh, initiate an inflammatory response. And then, hey, all of a sudden you got psoriasis now. Interesting. And then also, what about the gut brain connection? Because, you know, we're starting to hear how so much of mental health and keeping our brains healthy and our mood, especially now with COVID and you know, all of the stressors, economic and, and otherwise, how do we, uh, how do you connect the brain science to the gut science and in terms of what we're going to do in next couple of minutes of what to do about strengthening the gut? What is that connection and how did that get established? Yeah, so um, we have a, a vagus nerve that comes from the brain and is connected to the gut. And this is, you can consider like the Autobahn in, in Germany. It's an information superhighway. And we have information continually zipping up and down. It's happening right now as we're listening, as we're speaking. It's happening no matter what. It's There's no on or off switch to that. It's always happening. And 
this is um, a, one of the main communication methods by which um, the gut and the brain can talk to each other. And we know the brain can impact the gut and the gut can impact the brain um, because it's not just a one-way highway, it's a two-way highway. And serotonin, I mean, tell us about serotonin because that was pretty eye-opening to me about where that resides and what that's about. Yeah, um, it, you know, 90 to 95% of the serotonin um, that uh, we have in our body comes from the digestive tract. So, um, you know, I often tell people, okay, if you're depressed or anxious, sure, we can, um, you know, you can take a medication to help increase the serotonin, but uh, we can also focus on the gut because that's where, that's where your natural store is. So let's work on that. I think it's great. And, um, and you know, it's hard for people to kind of wrap their head around it. I once saw a uh, electron microscopy image, which is like the most alar enlarged or microscopic image you can get. And it actually showed these little buggers going up and down this Audubon, this vagus nerve to and from the brain. And it just blew my mind. Um, so we really do have evidence, like real evidence that these bacteria um, go up and down the brain to the brain, to the gut and back and forth all the time. So um, it's pretty fascinating stuff. Um, so tell me a little bit about, I mean, in the chapter that you wrote for my my text for Oxford, you, you really broke it down so beautifully. Um, you talked about chlorinated chemicals, like in drinking water. You talked about all sorts of specifics. Are there any specific chemicals that you can kind of just, you know, you know, that we're all exposed to um, and, and kind of tell us what they, where they are and what they might be doing to our gut? I think, you know, I think one of the important things is to realize that these chemicals can come from all over the place. It's not just, you know, pesticides, which is one of the most common things that we think about. Oh, you must be talking about Roundup. Yeah, okay, we know Roundup is bad. But, you know, this could be flame retardants. It could be, you know, uh, chemicals uh, that are from your paint. Uh, they could be chemicals in your flooring, uh, in your house. It could be in your clothes. Uh, you know, there's there's so many different uh, chemicals that um, that we're exposed to uh, on an ongoing basis. I mean, I think there's even some studies showing that a, a, a baby when they're born could potentially have hundreds of uh, chemicals in their core blood. These are humans that uh, haven't even seen anything, you know, in their life. And um, the mother has been exposed to so many things, uh, you know, during pregnancy, not, not intentionally, right. this is just life. And um, this is what you get as a result. And, and so, and you broke down. I think drinking water was one of the things I talk about a lot now. And and I always refer back to to what you were writing about chlorine, chlorinated water, de detergents mm -hmm. that are used in you know our hundred and sixty thousand water treatment plants mm -hmm. that that supply about 250 million Americans. The other 50 million Americans usually get well water, which has its own issues in terms of gut microbiome contaminants. But what I thought mm -hmm. was interesting is, is how you broke down chlorine, chlorinated chemicals, and the, and the detergents used to clean and scrub that water before it kind of goes out towards our homes. You know, and, and, and how that, that kind of works. I mean, you know, you have some thoughts on that, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, there's one study that we reviewed that looked and showed that when you, you have chlorinated water, it can actually change the gut microbiome. So we have particular um, strains, you know, like clostridium perfringens, um, where you can uh, actually have uh, uh, an exposure and uh, change the uh, composition of the microbiome. And these changes have been associated with uh, formation of colon tumors even. So, you know, you don't think like, okay, well, I'll drink chlorinated water. It's okay. It's no, no big deal. You wouldn't think that, okay, well, if I drink this on an ongoing basis all the time, it may be a risk factor for colon cancer. I don't think we ever think about things like that, but the information is there. I mean, um, and, you know, and I always tell people that you can drive yourself crazy thinking about toxins and reading about toxins and you know, it's not necessarily one thing that, okay, you, you take these talk, you know, you're exposed to this toxin and you're, you're finished, you know, it's, that's not how the body works. It's kind of like, uh, adding extra drips in your bucket. And if you have too many of these drips at, at the wrong time, the wrong place, and that's kind of where, uh, you're going to get a, an issue potentially. Do you, um, do you recommend a sort of a, uh, one solution to the drinking water problem? Do you recommend filtering water? I mean, do you filter water? I mean, you're in California, 
when I was I out do, there, yeah. they gave me a hard time in the audience, um, and I had a good answer for it, I believe, but for reverse osmosis, which is actually very aggressive water cleaning, which is not very expensive. You can get a machine for 250, 300. But in California, where there's water restrictions, someone raised their hands and said, oh, I think we're gonna be charged too much money on our water bill. And my answer was, you're really only using that, that type of filtration, and there's many types, um, for drinking and cooking. So it ends up really not being a lot of water usage. So what are your thoughts in California, knowing what you know about the gut, how do you, how do you kind of clean your water for you and your family? We use reverse osmosis for drinking water and uh, for cooking and things like that. Um, I think, you know, uh, the the water quality may not be the best here. <laughs> um, so um, we have a whole house water filtration system also in place, too, for, you know, even the, the tap water that comes in. So um, uh, if you compare uh, the water from the tap, use even let's something simple like a TDS meter which says total dissolved solutes, and you look at the tap water, I don't know, the number is usually around 250 here in California. And then if you um, uh, compare it against your reverse osmosis, it's like five or 10 or something like that. So, so it's just the most aggressive way to get stuff off of water. It's kind of, I look at it like dialysis. My dad's a doc, uh, dialysis or kidney specialist, I'm with my brother. And we always talk about RO filters for blood and making human blood clean before, you know, putting it back in, you know, for people with mm -hmm. kidney failure. I always wonder, well, why aren't we thinking like that in terms of water when our bodies are essentially made up of 80% water? So, um, but there are all types of filters. And if people aren't in the mood or in financially able, even at 250, 300, uh, an RO, a vetted consumer reports um, reverse osmosis system, there's also carbon filters. And I think, you know, from pitchers, you know, all sorts of Brita, zero water, you know, all the faucet ones, all the refrigerator door ones. And I think that that's really valuable, um, especially for pregnant and, and, you know, as you mentioned, uh, pregnant women who expose a lot to their fetus unknowingly. Um, so I think that's really great to mention. Tell me about your thoughts on medications and the gut. Because people don't really think of medications as, say, chemicals. Um, and I think people need to think that it's not perhaps just antibiotics that may mess with the gut. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, medication certainly can impact the microbiome. Uh, sometimes, you know, in a negative way and sometimes in a positive way, we don't even really understand. I mean, a medication like metformin, for example, is a classic medication that um, people with diabetes or blood sugar um, issues use. Um, uh, the microbiome uh, is impacted by this drug in particular, and this may be the mechanism by which blood sugar is better controlled. I think uh, drug companies don't even realize this when they're when they're making these drugs. And uh, I was, I think it was a few years ago, I was talking with somebody. I said, when they, uh, whenever they make a new drug, they should really be uh, evaluating what happens to the microbiome. Um, in, in the process of uh, using this drug, because that may be wherein a lot of the changes happen, or maybe some negative impacts may happen as well. No, I think it's interesting because even metformin also can affect nutrition levels of, say, B12, right? Um, and so right. you can have both good and bad effects. Usually, I would argue a little bit more disruption than any benefit of a medication to the actual gut. But mm -hmm. we all can't get off our medicine so quickly. And so that kind of flips back to, well, what can we do to get off meds? You know, and maybe that's a direction, you know, as you know, because you're an integrative and functional medicine doctor and you do a, a lot of work trying to get people's personalized choices in order that fits their physique, their body. Um, so I think that's really um, interesting. So tell me a little bit about your philosophy and your practice, because you did open a really incredible clinic out west and uh, you have some a new appointment at the Samueli Institute which is really quite cool and impressive so tell me a little bit about your philosophy for your practice and what you're able to do for patients well um, through the process of reading and learning and going through the fellowship and writing this book chapter for you and writing the, the textbook uh, I kind of realized that, there are a lot of things that play into uh, how to figure out what to do for somebody. So I, I had the idea, I said, well, wouldn't it be cool if you could look at somebody's microbiome, their genetics, their exposures, 
their inflammatory markers, their history, you know, talking with them, combine all of this information together and then help them understand what they should do, how they should live, what they should eat, what things they should avoid, how they should exercise and things like that. And that's where the idea of um, Precision Clinic uh, came from. So that's what I do. I I take all these various aspects. We do all these kind of testing to kind of understand, you know, exactly what's going on. And then we put it all together and uh, help deliver a, a program for people with the principles of integrative medicine, you know, as the driver for what kind of recommendations we give. So it's not like, okay, well, it looks like your cholesterol is high. We're going to put you on Lipitor today. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about, you know, an integrative approach to your health um, and uh, using various modalities to deliver the, the recommendations. Yeah. And it's integrative medicine, which is so interesting is that you're integrating the best of what's offered in terms of a holistic approach, you know, discussing diet and drinking water and how to filter it and which types of foods have process are processed or, or which foods are actually appropriate for your body, if you're gluten sensitive or if you're dairy sensitive and those kind of things. But then it also allows medicines if they're needed. And I think that's what's the beauty of integrative. It's not saying this is all bad and this is all good. It's how do we kind of maximize your health through all of the tools that are available. Exactly. Um, and and, and, and what, I, I created yeah. a term called precisionomics. And so I thought it was just kind of, we trademarked that term because I thought it was really cool because it's basically using all of this information to deliver uh, healthcare and uh, uh, using all these omics, you know, the genome, the microbiome, the metabolome, and, you know, just kind of uh, delivering that uh, information to somebody. So we call it precisionomics. And you're right. I mean, if somebody needs medication, then they need medication. We're not like homeopathy here. You know, uh, if they need medication, they need medication. If you have, I always remember the first day of fellowship, right? Uh, Andy Weil says, if you got cancer and you, you need chemotherapy, you're going to get chemotherapy. If, if you're having a heart attack, you're not going to sit in the parking lot of the emergency department meditating it out. You're going to get a cardiac cath, you know? So, I say you the know. same thing. <laughs> and, and, lup and my lupus patients, like you're not going to, you know, with severe cases that are acute and you really worry some, you're not going to say, all right, you know, just go take a walk and, you know, uh, and take some fish oil and you'll be just fine. I mean, there's real um, health hazards and risks that go along with some of the diseases you're taking care of. Like, you know, this is real stuff, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, GI bleeds. Um, and I'm taking care of acute, you know, renal failure and lupus and, you know, um, temporal arteritis. So there are, I think the bonus of being both a Western trained doctor, even though it has its problems, we know that, um, and certainly with training in, in, in medical schools. But if you combine that with these tools that you have to want to learn, I mean, you and I had to want to learn, right, to go figure this out. So um, I think it's really a bonus for patients to have the benefit of those two worlds, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what's all it is. It's more tools in your toolbox, right? That's what they, that's what I always tell people. It doesn't mean it's not, it's not necessarily alternative. It's integrative. So integrative means you're integrating everything together. So yeah, I think it's awesome. And I, and I wish more doctors were around. I mean, to find an integrative gastroenterologist on the East coast is pretty much unheard of. I mean, I'm always texting. There's only you. one. There's only I'm like, one. I'm <laughs> Marvin. I've got a patient I need some help with. I think we managed a patient together. Um, from, from the West coast. And he was a very severe ulcerative colitis, um, uh, patient actually was like a, an NFL football player. I can't even say names, but I mean, this guy really needed to function. He wanted to be back on the field and this guy was suffering. So, and I remember you and I, one of my favorite actual cases is that you really were able to help me help him because it wasn't my field, but we, we spoke the same language. So I thought that was very cool. Um, and I'm glad you're available for telehealth and to doing all that now. Um, so let's shift gears a second. So tell me first, what are your recommendations for sort of bolstering the gut, making the gut work for you, as I tell my patients, is how do you how do you get your gut healthy so that it then goes on to give you the benefits and, and the health that comes from the actual upstream issue of gut problems? So one of the one of the key principles I, I teach people about is that some of the best medicine that you can take for the gut is 100% free. It's not a medicine I'm going to give you. It's not a supplement I'm going to give you. It's, it's all in your choices that you make and how you live. 
Um, one of the things that I loved learning about the most is how these lifestyle factors can actually influence the microbiome. You know, it's kind of funny how how we were designed as humans, you know, uh, almost intentionally, I, I, I would assume that if you do certain things, you know, act certain ways, live in a certain manner, then, you know, a lot of good things happen for your survival. And that's kind of how we we're built. We weren't built necessarily needing medicines or supplements, but, you know, as we get older, you know, and our life expectancy gets longer, you know, the other things happen inside the body chemically too, where you may need certain things um, because certain things happen. But really, I mean, if you, the, the baseline core principles, if you're not doing these, then um, it's going to be a little bit harder to, to fix things, right? You have to be sleeping the right amount. You have to be eating the, the right kind of foods, no junk foods, processed foods. Um, you want to eat a lot of organic, non-GMO, you know, plant-based foods. Uh, I'm not a vegan by any means, but, you know, you got to, no matter what you are, I, I think you got to have uh, vegetables and fruits uh, in your diet um, because that's a good source of fiber and antioxidants and a lot of other plant nutrients. Um, you have to be modulating your stress, which means that you, you have to really realize, understand, and appreciate that stress really impacts us, uh, even on the chemical level, it changes the microbiome. Um, just as an aside, a, a quick, a quick, uh, story, you know, not really a story cause it's a, it's a, it's a study, but they, um, in our book, uh, the integrative, uh, GI book, one of the authors, uh, Emron Meyer, who's an expert in, um, the microbiome wrote that when you have stress or anxiety, the stress, the situation that you're under can actually change the chemical environment in the gut and a microbe that is ordinarily a good microbe or some a commensal that's not doing anything bad to you can actually become pathogenic. So that's really a fascinating concept, right? So if, if you're stressed out and you're anxious all the time, um, then you could literally be changing your microbiome, uh, especially if it's happening over and over without any kind of intervention. So mo monitoring your stress and understanding stress reduction um, can really help influence your overall health. So that is part of uh, gut health, you know, uh, and, and uh, changes, social the pH changes also. Um, which means the acidity level just from stress can change, which makes it for kind of a not a great environment for many bacteria to thrive. I mean, that's why recommendations like fermented foods and kombucha and kimchi, some foods that I don't really like, or apple cider vinegar or pickles, or I mean, there's a lot of them. Those actually change the pH. But when stress gets involved, stress can change it not to our benefit. So, and you see when you, when you, when you, uh, and often these things go together. So if you're not sleeping well, you're more prone to stress. And when you're more prone to stress, instead of, um, doing something good in the morning, like having, you know, uh, a healthy breakfast, you may go for that bagel or that donut. So now you got, you're like, well, I know I shouldn't be eating the donut in the morning, but it's not just the donut. There were three things that happened and you didn't even think about that. And you're going to do that over and over and over again. And all of a sudden we wonder why we can't lose weight or why we're angry all the time or why now I have joint aches or pains. And there's a lot of things that go into it. So, you know, uh, as within those bad choices or, or not so great choices are also chemical exposures that are inadvertent. So you eat that bagel, but that bagel has, you know, a lot of chemicals inside of it also that has emulsifiers. These are obesogens, these are endocrine disruptors. And so it just kind of, just like you feel like things can snowball out of control when you start reversing these things, they can snowball into control. So I, I love telling that to people. So it's not like, oh, you're doomed because you're doing all these things. You can reverse these things. And when you start realizing that there are things that you can do that are free because they're all on you and you understand that these are the things that if you do them, they can reverse some of your problems and you see that happen in real life then you really understand that uh, lifestyle uh, choices really play a huge role. So that's really one of the main main lessons that I have as far as 
simple things that people can do to help bolster their immune system. Didn't this work uh, with you? I mean, you you talk yeah. pretty openly about how you are at one point pretty overweight and you were sluggish and you know, you were running around training. I think you're in medical school or residency and you had starting to have a family. So, you know, tell us about your personal experience and how actually all those recommendations helped you. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I first started learning integrative medicine, I said, well, let's try some of this stuff. And that's kind of my um, my mentality for a lot of things, even if it's a new herb or a supplement. Uh, if I if I learn or hear about something and how it could be used, I, I try it on myself first, whether I need it or not, just to make sure that it's okay. Um, and um, uh, I started doing a lot of this, uh, these lifestyle changes to myself, started with diet choices, you know, simple things. You know, um, uh, I, you know, I was drinking Coke Zero because Coke Zero is better than Coke, right? Because there's no sugar, right? It's supposed to be better for you. Um, you know, um, I'm having a sandwich instead of Wendy's drive through you know, during my lunch breaks. But that's better for you, right? I'm eating healthy. But those, these are really, there, there are still a lot of poor health choices there. So you start making a few minor choices. I think in, in some of those easy early choices that I, that I changed, I lost 10 pounds right off the bat. Um, uh, and then I started involving some of the other things, uh, exercise, um, making sure I was sleeping better. Um, and I started losing a lot of weight. Um, the funny thing is that, you know, I guess I was still maybe less of a believer of stress uh, as really playing a role um, uh, in the very, very beginning. And I said, well, let me just try this, this, I'm going to really take this seriously. I'm going to start, uh, meditating regularly. I'm going to practice these breathwork techniques. I'm going to, you know, listen to these meditation CDs. And when I hit my plateau and I, uh, of weight loss, and then I started doing this, then the weight started losing again. So, uh, really the body does respond to these, these things very nicely. It's almost like, um, you're a conductor in an orchestra and, um, you know, if, if you're only doing one of these things or two of these things, you're, you're the conductor, you're only paying attention to the violins or the flutes, but you have a whole group of people who are ready to play. So you have the conductor wand in your hand. And if you can, you can get the whole group to play nicely, you'll have a beautiful song at the end of the day. It's great. It's great metaphor and great image, actually. Um, so yeah, I love how you and myself included, we we both had a reason to make changes. Like we both felt we had, I mean, my dog died and I did, you know, a whole thing on, on how my dog died and I kind of figure out what might environmentally be affecting his unusual disease. And then I kind of started to see why these regulations weren't for human food and human environmental chemicals. And then I kind of took it on to my, you know, that I have to fix this in my body. And so did you. And I think that's what makes it personal and more effective if you own it and it means something, you know, you buy into it. Some people get really sick and then that's when they, or a heart attack, God forbid, and that's when they start making those changes. And I think the message really is, is try to go way upstream before anything horrible happens and believe that prevention does make a difference. And it's almost like a faith. It's almost like, a, you know, you have to believe that it's going to make a difference. Vitamins or supplements if you needed them, but really mostly food and avoidance and free, free things. Nature. I mean, nature remarkably, you know, affects our mood and, and gut and, and brain um, chemicals. So... Yeah, there are even there are even there are even studies looking at um, I think CRP levels in um, in forest bathing. You know, they they have they have I forget this it was a while ago when I looked at the study, but there are studies where they they take people and they show they put them like sit on a, a bench in the city or sit on a bench in um, in the middle of a forest where there's a very peaceful environment and they they can see that inflammation levels are down stress levels are down just for 15 minutes i think they're they're not terribly long periods of time it's fascinating and actually our first guest for our very first podcast um was dr suzanne hackenmiller who's a a graduate of, of arizona in our program and she actually wrote a book on on shinrin ruko uh if i pronounced it right but far speeding and she ties all that in so i think um, we're starting to put the pieces together as practitioners in terms of all of the little bits that make a difference. Um, so that's really great. I think all of that was wonderful advice. Um, and in terms of probiotics, now this is a really complicated topic. It was for me, and I'm sure some of your audience, our audience is going to be wondering, like, that's the question. What are probiotics? 
why might they be important as a supplement, maybe even versus food or food versus supplement? And then what should you look for? What are the, the actual usable tools in terms of choosing a good one? That is a good question. It's a tough question too, because it's not always easily answered. Um, in, so first of all, a probiotic is, you can think of as a, a good guy bacteria. It's a supplement of good guy bacteria. It's not necessarily a supplement in a pill though, by the way. So we were talking about kimchi and kombucha and things like that. Those are probiotic foods because they are fermented and they contain good bacteria that can help um, keep good balance in your microbiome in your gut. So that's actually a very nice source uh, of good probiotics because not only do you get the nutritional benefit of the food itself, but you're also getting um, a good dose of probiotics along with it as well. Um, and in some cases, probiotics may not be a good choice for somebody because if they have a really bad dysbiosis or an imbalance or they have bacterial overgrowth or SIBO, for example, if they try to take probiotics, they may actually get an increase in symptoms. There's actually a study published on this as well, uh, created a lot of controversy, but I think that the, the main point that authors were trying to make is that, you know, if you have too much going on there, then probiotics may not always be the answer. They could actually make you feel worse. Um, you know, uh, the analogy I give is, say you got a uh, hundred people in a room and um, the, the fire marshal comes and says, hey, you can only have 50 people in this room. It's a, it's a fire hazard. If 50 people of you have to get out. So then you have the choice. How are you going to make those people get out? You could open the door and ask them to leave, or you could send in another 100 people to bum rush them, hoping you'll squeeze out those extra 50 people. Um, but what happens if those 100 people that you send in to bum rush actually said, hey, this looks like a party. I'm going to stay too. Now what? You have a bigger problem and an even uh, worse violation with the fire marshal. So, sounds like the party's going on in the Jersey Shore right now with COVID. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like you know they keep expanding. We're like, there's a pandemic going on here. So I think that last one uh, tricked my mind there. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So that's basically the idea of uh, you know uh, where there's a situation where you could have uh, too much imbalance, too much overgrowth, and then you throw more things into the mix, and now you have even worse problem than you had when you started. So I think you kind of have to really look at each person's individual situation, what symptoms they're describing and decide whether you want to try for probiotics first or whether they should maybe be treated for bacterial overgrowth before you do that. Which is antibiotics, which, you know, even in our world of Western and integrative, sometimes you have to clear out the bad guys to make room to re-inoculate or put in the good guys again. But the great, um, the great thing is that uh, my mentor, Jerry Mullen, uh, did a, a beautiful study um, in 2014, published an article with the group at Johns Hopkins comparing antibiotics against a couple of different proprietary herbal blends and um, found that they were equivalent um, uh, in helping people with uh, overgrowth. So we don't always have to use antibiotics as a, a treatment choice. We can use... Um, some natural treatments too, which may be, um, you know, better weathered by the uh, microbes in the gut. Interesting. What <laughs> herbs were in that study, just out of curiosity, not that anyone should go ahead and do this on their own, but I'm just curious. They're combo, they're combo. So there's a bunch of different things in each, each pill, but um, uh, candy backed in AR and candy backed in BR uh, uh, was one regimen and FC cidal and dysbiocide was another regimen. So these are herbal types of, these are herbal blends with a lot of different things in them. Yeah. So, um, and in clinical uh, practice, you know, I, I do this a lot and um, I, I, I see this, the results of the study in, in real life too. So um, I see that the, um, results are about the same. Interesting. And then, you know, what kind, what's a probiotic and what's a symbiotic just to get the terminology right. And, and how can we do it very inexpensively for probiotic or prebiotic? Now we, ha now we have postbiotics. Too. Oh, geez. Okay. I'm so, <laughs> my head's spinning. So, uh, probiotic, uh, we said is the, is the actual, uh, microbe. So they're the good guy bacteria. Then we have a prebiotic. You can think of that as the food for those um, good guy bacteria, like the fertilizer. It's basically a fiber type substance that can help those good bacteria grow and flourish. 
when we have a symbiotic, it's actually a supplement of both a probiotic and a prebiotic together. So they call it a symbiotic. And then a postbiotic is basically a good product uh, of, of, that would come from the production that would be produced by an actual good microbe. So butyrate is a classic example of a postbiotic. So when we eat fiber and vegetables in our diet, the good bacteria produce short chain fatty acids. One example of that is butyrate. Butyrate is an anti-inflammatory. It helps reduce inflammation. It's a very helpful compound um, that is produced by the gut microbes. And you can get a supplement of these too. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. And, um, and look, they're getting more and more creative as the studies, you know, it used to be, you know, we still don't know which particular bacteria for, per se is going to lead to any specific health benefits in, uh, we know for IBS, but not for like, you know, rheumatoid or lupus, we can't solve the chronic condition yeah. with one particular uh, probiotic at this point or strain. But we know a diversity. We know that adding diversity to the gut is better than perhaps adding one particular strain versus another. So, you know, I tell my patients, tell me if I'm wrong, to kind of look on a label of a, of a vetted product. Good brands matter in terms of purity. And to look for diversity, as many different bugs as they can find. And then how, how do you tell them or what do you tell them in terms of how many billion and how do you match that just generally? Because I know obviously people need a personalized yeah, evaluation. Yeah, generally, you know, I think generally around 50 billion units is probably a good one to shoot for. Um, there are obviously ones that are less and more. And For an adult. Uh, for an adult, yeah, for 50 billion units at least. But, um, you know, uh, like you said, diversity is key. So that's one of the um, main concepts to kind of keep in mind. And um, uh, if you're just doing it for general health, then it may be good to kind of get a probiotic that, um, has a lot of different beneficial strains because that may be a good broad spectrum, um, you know, supplement for you if you're just trying to do something, you know, like that. Um, uh, I, I really believe, you know, I, I was wondering whether you were going to ask me about fecal transplant next, <laughs> if that's where we were going. I don't now, know. But... It's, it's so exciting <laughs> to have you on. I, I feel very, uh, <laughs> Excited to try out all these questions, but if you want to talk about them, I think it'd be great. But, you know, along the lines of probiotics and microbes, uh, fecal transplant sometimes comes up because we think, well, if you want diversity, you want to change the microbiome, why don't we just do a fecal transplant? Let's just reset the whole thing. But, you know, as you kind of alluded to, what Tell are our audience what a fecal transplant is for, oh. for people who don't know. It's a, a fancy word for something that sounds really gross, but go for it. Yeah, it's where, uh, where we have, uh, we actually have stool donor banks uh, where people donate their stool and, um, you know, it's screened and made sure that there's no like, you know, hepatitis C, HIV, you know, any parasites, things like that. And um, uh, they, they create a solution basically. And, you can deliver the solution in a couple of different ways. So I could do a colonoscopy and dump it off in the end of the colon. Um, there's also a, uh, a, a nasojejunal route. So you could have a, a an NG tube placed and um, it could be put down there. And I think there are capsules also that people can take. Um, and suppositories I don't, and, you know. All sorts I, I don't of personally way. prefer the oral route uh, just because, you know, in case something happens, you know. Philosophically, you you're eating someone's poop and we, you know, yeah. it doesn't always feel so savory. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're basically trying to deliver this big clump of someone else's cleaned healthy poop into your own GI tract, particularly. Basically like a massive probiotic enema or, you know, it's basically that's what it is. So do you see results in patients. I mean, do you think, what are your thoughts? I mean, in this country, is it FDA approved? I mean, where are we going with that here? In this country, we can only use it in the case of uh, severe C. diff infection. So C. diff is a bad bacteria that can happen in the colon, can cause really bad diarrhea, and um, kills thousands of people a year for, you know, and, and it's an amazing almost cure, which is just remarkable. Yeah, it's a, I mean, people can lose their colon, people can die. I mean, if it's really bad. So um, this, uh, and we have antibiotics, but sometimes the antibiotics don't work uh, well enough. Um, and we can use a fecal transplant. And basically, it's just like a massive reset button. And the results are uh, amazing, you know, in the literature and in real practice people feel better within the next day even, you know, so 
um, that's definitely a tool we can use. But, you know, we want uh, people obviously curious, can I use this for my rheumatoid arthritis? Can I use it for my lupus? Can I use it for my fibromyalgia? And I think it's still wild, wild west when it comes to that, because when we're using it for a specific purpose like that, autoimmunity and things like that, how do we really know what is going to happen when we take all these microbes and mix them in with what you currently have? Are you going to get better or are you going to get better and then now have a risk for colon cancer? Uh, is something else going to happen? I don't think we really know yet. I think what would be awesome one day, you know, and here's an idea for somebody uh, thinking about making a company is to, is to maybe figure out how to do a personalized fecal transplant. So, you, you know, when we have enough knowledge base, we can analyze your microbiome and what the risks are and then try to figure out what microbes might be beneficial for you to kind of reverse those problems because you're obviously thinking about doing it for a purpose um, and, and then perhaps um, uh, develop a fecal transplant uh, or something yeah. like that specifically think, for that person. Yeah, I think it's going to happen. I mean, you can sort of map to your DNA, but then also knowing that your DNA is not entirely set because of the epigenome, which means our, our lifestyle and environment plays a key role in whether our genetics actually are, get expressed or those genes are expressed. Um, but tying that to the gut microbiome would be fascinating. And I, I, I kind of think it's going to happen at one, at one, some point in the future. But, um, but for now, we just kind of do almost a spaghetti on the wall approach a little bit, like see if it sticks. You know, you throw a reasonable probiotic that's vetted. Again, I say vetted because brands are not all the same. Um, and then kind of see how symptoms go in many cases, right? Um, yeah, there are certain probiotics like the spore-based probiotics are quite popular because um, there there is literature showing that they help reduce lipopolysaccharides and um, help uh, reduce intestinal permeability or leaky gut. So they they have a role as well. And um, there are also uh, there are also precision probiotics out there too, where um, uh, people are starting to have their microbiome sequenced and. Um, having a probiotic created for them based on that. So I think we're moving in that direction and really personalized approach to everything is, is key. If you don't know, then you don't know. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's the simple saying that I have. If you don't know, then you're just kind of guessing. So if you ask me what diet should I eat, I can tell you what diet you maybe should eat, but I don't really know for sure. And anybody telling you that they know for sure that if you eat X, Y, or Z is going to cure your problem, they're just making it up based on not just making it up just just because they're lying to you. They're they're making it up basically means that they're using their clinical experience and their knowledge base to make a judgment and give a recommendation. But the best thing would be to understand your genetics, your your microbiome, your sensitivities, all of these things, and and put it together and then try to make a recommendation based on that. That's at least trying to hone in on it a little bit better. And thinking about anthropology, I always like to pull anthropology into every discussion if people do believe in evolution, which not everyone does, but, you know, kind of understanding how far we've evolved for 4.5 million years and we're sort of having this onslaught of chemicals just in 200 years, it's just unheard of and stress and, you know, um, you know, food chemicals and water contamination. And so I like people to think sort of upstream, you know, how did we used to live? I mean, Yes, we could have gotten eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, um, but we didn't have stress levels that remained always high, you know? And so um, I think we're gonna get to precision and I think we're moving in that direction, but I never wanted to also take away, you know, precision like in probiotic type of stuff, take away from really the easy low-hanging fruit, which we all have access to, right? Um, Literally fruit. Literally, literally. <laughs> of course, I meant to put that in there, wink, wink. Um, but now I want to switch gears. Now I'm going to not laugh uh, because we're sort of in this muck of COVID-19. I mean, what's the date? We're taping this around um, beginning of August and it'll probably air or be available in September. It's kind of mid-September. So things will be very different by then. And, you know, as we're, you and I know, medicine um, and healthcare is changing within the COVID environment, uh, like rapid speed in terms of medicine, journals, in terms of communication from around the world between healthcare um, specialists and trying, you know, what position to put the patient in when they're in the ICU for oxygenation, yeah. which, of course, which therapies, also, which even uh, nutrients that we're noticing are low for people that are ending up in worse case cases, you know, so... 
Um, like vitamin D, for instance, has been um, implicated as a problem for those who go on to have worse outcomes. Tell me a little bit, um, A, whatever you want to tell me about COVID-19, because I'm sure you have a lot to say. And then also tie in, if you wouldn't mind, a really interesting article um, about uh, a certain health condition like reflux or, or, or GI reflux or heartburn and the medicines used, um, common medicine, medicines used to treat that and, and what's been found so far. It might change, but what's been found so far? Yeah, I mean, COVID-19 is a very interesting virus. And I don't think we don't, not I don't think, I, I know we don't know everything about this thing. Um, there, uh, there are a lot of uh, potential implications downstream even that uh, people are talking about with this post-COVID syndrome. Um, and we know that uh, the virus can replicate uh, and be present in the gut too, in, in the stool. Um, so how that, I mean, surely that must impact the microbiome. I, I don't even know that we know yet. Um, perhaps, uh, some of the downstream effects that we may potentially see in the future may, uh, may have something to do with that. Um, definitely going to be a very interesting uh, place to follow in the literature. I think, um, while we try to figure some of those things out, there's some key things that we should be aware of. And when people are doing studies, for example, uh, with this acid reflux study that you're referring to, we should kind of pay attention to those things and um, uh, try to use uh, alternatives when when possible. And this is really, this is the beauty of integrative medicine, again, showing itself. Um, we can use uh, PPIs, uh, like, you know, the proton pump inhibitors to help with our acid reflux or indigestion. Um, and, Give me an and, example of a PPI for the audience who don't know exactly what medicine they may be taking. That like is Prilosec or Nexium are two uh, common uh, brands that are even over the counter, available over the counter. The purple pill, you know, um, uh, so lovingly referred to, uh, but uh, can cause a lot of problems potentially, um, not just related to COVID-19, but we know that, you know, magnesium deficiency, B12 deficiency, other things like that. Um, uh, even SIBO uh, imbalances in the microbiome can occur as a result of long-term use of these medications. Um, you know, uh, and there was a really interesting study that was just published by um, a very, very respected gastroenterologist at several different uh, major academic institutions um, that kind of uh, demonstrated that those people who were taking um, these medications, these types of medications, um, were more uh, prone to having problems with COVID-19. And it was dose dependent. So if you were taking it twice a day versus once a day, your risk was higher as well. So that's a very interesting, you know, I, I don't know, uh, the mechanism could be perhaps that, you know, when you lower the acidity in the stomach, um, you may be fixing your problem as far as your symptom is concerned. But um, you are allowing perhaps your microbiome to be more susceptible to bad guys coming in um, and imbalances that can occur. Uh, and perhaps as a result, uh, COVID-19 is able to hit everybody else in there a little bit harder, potentially. I don't know if that's the case or not, but um, that would be an interesting study to look at as well. But these are things, you know, like, a, you know, I, I try not to use these PPIs to begin with. Um, you know, they have a role. I mean, if you're vomiting blood in the hospital because you have a huge ulcer with a vessel in it and we have to treat it. I mean, we don't want you to die from that either. So you're going to get, you're going to get a PPI. You're going to get it because that's, that's the standard of care and we don't want you to die. But I don't want you to necessarily be on that medication for months and months and months and years and years afterwards, because that's what happens a lot. People will realize that these medications are good uh, for their symptoms and they keep taking it. And I don't know that the initial intention for development of these drugs was even for long-term indefinite use, but somehow it kind of went along that way. But, you know, if you talk to people about, you know, you really shouldn't be drinking alcohol at night and uh, mixing that with your ice cream and chips and popcorn uh, at, at 10 o'clock at night and then going to sleep at 11, that's not good for you uh, because you're going to get heartburn. Um, so if you alter your lifestyle patterns and what you eat and how you live uh, and reduce stress, because even people that have refractory heartburn, um, uh, uh, at least a third of them or more, uh, the main driving factor is, is uh, unchecked stress. So uh, a lot of these things, if we can manage them, 
um, we can reduce our symptoms uh, naturally through that way. And then we have things that we can use uh, if we want, if we need to use a product like DGL, which is deglycerisinated licorice and slippery elm and ginger and things like that. Um, and these are natural ways of treating the common problem that, in my experience, work just as well. Um, and they've been uh, around even, even thousands. Better. They've been around thousands of years. I think people don't realize that a lot of integrative medicine pulls in herbal medicine with robust studies that show their benefit and have been steady, studied quite well and have been around for literally thousands of years. Um, so I agree with you. So there's not always the marketing of a, of a new drug that, that that's going to benefit us, benefit us in the long run. And PP, PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, have been linked to higher rates of C. difficile, which we just talked about, C. diff infection. Um, and maybe right. that you, because it changes, it literally switches off the acid production of these cells. So it's, it works at the cellular level, whereas many of the things you and I talk to our patients about is not just lifestyle, but the supplements that just coat the gut. And they're more mechanical in the sense they coat, they don't turn off cells that we need and have evolved with for millions of years. So um, yeah, I think it's really quite interesting that that's, that's panning out now. And um, yeah, there's better ways to do it. So so thanks for sharing some of those ideas with us. And um, other types of things you want to talk about with COVID-19, what are what would be some recommendations? Um, obviously, stress is really high right now, super high. Um, and of course, that plays into the gut. You know, what, what, would, what do you tell your patients right now in, in face of all of this craziness? Um, you know, what do you tell your, your family members who probably call on you and, and, and other people? Well, just like, you know, when you're trying to optimize your health or, uh, you know, to try to be healthy, you want to stick to the basics, um, like we talked about of lifestyle medicine. I think in COVID-19, that's also fundamental. We got to stick to the basics, the basic principles, hand washing, wearing your fa uh, face masks, social distancing. It, it is not um, some uh, weird conspiracy theory that uh, you, you, you should wear masks because there's some ulterior motive to that. You know, uh, you should wear masks because uh, masks have been demonstrated even in the literature. There are studies showing how masks save lives. So that's the fundamental. Before you start looking for supplements and medications and things like that, the fundamental principle is follow those basic things, hand washing, social distancing, putting on the masks. And there are things that you can do. Um, you know, there was actually a really nice article published by, you know, our group at the University of Arizona, um, where um, they uh, went through some of the different herbals and things like that, that you can do to kind of help with your immune system. Things like zinc and vitamin C and vitamin D. And, you know, there are a few other, you know, herbals that uh, can be used to kind of help boost the immune system. Um, there um, has been some literature coming out about uh, nicotinamide riboside or NAD supplements that might potentially help uh, in the setting of COVID-19. I've had a few guests on my podcast um, talk about some of these uh, aspects as well. It's quite interesting. Um, so we're, there are things that we can do uh, from that regards as well. Um, but, uh, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, one of the things melatonin was a big thing that came out and, um, you know, and reducing stress is another thing that came out and you're kind of like thinking, oh, well, you know, if I reduce stress, I can help me against COVID-19. Go, oh, go figure that, you know, I mean, why is that? Well, why is that? It's because the same things, reasons why we're talking about its benefits in, in many other things, because the body responds to these things very nicely and you can modulate your immune system by, um, uh, stress reducing and doing all these kind of things, making sure you're sleeping well and making sure you're hydrating well and making sure you're relaxing. Um, uh, so all of these things uh, can be helpful as well in your in your whole health and in this setting too. How are your, we both have two young boys. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're unique in that a lot of our colleagues actually have older kids that are married or college or whatever. And like you and I are trying to just figure out how to survive with young families. <laughs> so how are your boys doing? And, um, and really, what do you tell them? What are your, what, what do you do to survive? And they survive <laughs> figuratively. And well, they you know, I, I won't lie. I mean, it's not easy. It's tough. I live in California. Um, I don't know. The East Coast, you're in, in New Jersey, may, yeah. may be a little bit in a in a better place than what it was originally, but um, California is still pretty hot and heavy over here. So, 
um, we haven't really stopped and started coming down uh, hard like we wanted to. So, you know, it's tough uh, and it affects everybody at different stages. Um, uh, but uh, they're doing real well. Um, we try to make sure we go outside as much as possible. We're lucky enough to have some green space in our backyard. And um, so we, you know, try to keep them physically active. And um, the other day, uh, it was funny, I saw um, my younger one, six year old, and he was in one of his virtual classes. And he's like, lying down on the chair. And I tell my wife, I said, what is he doing? He should be sitting up and listening to the teacher. And she says, no, no, he's doing a mindfulness class. He's meditating with the teacher online. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. That <laughs> is found, cool. She found a mindfulness class for kids. So, um, you know, so, you know, we try to teach them these things and try to put things in perspective, um, you know, as I do with my patients uh, as well. You know, th this is a phase and we're not going to be like this for uh, the, the rest of our lives. And if you really want to be a true survivor, then you always look at the problem and find the solution. Um, if you look at the problem and you start crying about it or you make yourself go nuts over it, you're never going to survive. You're not going to be one of the survivors. So, so I'm not talking in the literal sense of surviving, but I'm just talking more in a figurative sense. And if you look at a problem like COVID-19 and you say, well, how can I get through this? What, what are the issues that surround my personal life? And try to look to create solutions, then you'll be better off. You know, for every problem, there's a solution, no matter what. So whether it's COVID-19 or you know, problems at work or problems in marriage, where, where for every problem, there's a solution. If you don't spend the time identifying the problem and looking for the solutions, then you'll feel lost. And that's that's one of the main things that I teach the kids now at a young age. And I, and I talk to a lot of other people, you know, even adults need to understand and realize this as well. Um, and if you look at all the people that were successful business people like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, they all say the same thing, you know. Um, it, look at each of these situations, each of these problems like COVID-19 and try to find try to find the lesson in it. What, what am I supposed to learn from this experience and how can I use that to my benefit? Put a positive spin on it. Then it becomes a situation by which you can learn to make yourself better. I think that's great advice. Control, resilience, grit. Um, you know, I try to teach that to my kids uh, as well. So, and my patients really, and I'm learning. I'm learning and growing from this experience as horrible as it is. I'm learning what I value most and what gives me pleasure. And a great hot cup of organic Earl Grey is actually the most <laughs> valuable thing in my life right now. Um, so you start to really, um, you know, cut the fat. And, and as my mother says, don't sweat the small stuff. Um, so tell me, Marvin, it's been a great conversation. So I want you to tell me what projects are coming up, I think in November possibly, and um, where we can reach you. So just kind of let us know, um, you know, how we can find you if we want to as well, audience. Yeah, thanks. I have a lot of stuff going on. Sometimes it's hard for me to keep track of it. Um, we have a podcast called Precision the Healthcast. And so that's uh, ever growing. And we have some really amazing guests on there as well. You've been on the podcast too. So that's great. If everybody hasn't listened to it. You should at least check out our episode that we recorded together. Um, and I'm working on a book uh, called Own Your Health. Uh, which uh, basically outlines for everybody how to use these precisionomics tools in order to help optimize their health, you know, because uh, that was one of the main things that I kind of took away from my own experience is that I felt like I kind of got control over everything again. I, I knew what affected me and how it impacted me and what was important in my body. And I felt like I owned my health. And so that's where even the title of the book comes from. So it teaches everybody how to do that themselves. Um, and, uh, I, I have many different practices now. Uh, I don't have just one practice. I have my regular GI practice where I do, you know, endoscopies and colonoscopies. I still do hospital work. I still take call at night. You're still a real it, doctor, right? I'm Marvin? still a real doctor. Okay. I'm always going to gotcha. be, I think that that really kind of helps keep everything in perspective. You gotta, you can't get lost in the, in the world of, uh, other things and forget 
you know, what a real sick patient looks like, because you kind of lose perspective over that. And why you went into medicine in the first place, right? Right, right. And then uh, I have my precision clinic where we do these, this is my, this is where, this is my passion. This is my little baby where, where I have a separate practice where I do all these deep integrative evaluations and look into the microbiome and really do this, uh, um, with patients and spend a lot of time, not have any restrictions on time or how much, you know, uh, uh, you know, effort we need to put into helping make somebody better is really no restrictions, no holds barred. We just work really hard to try to help optimize somebody's health. Um, and I, I just started as the director of integrative gastroenterology at the Susan Samueli uh, Integrative Health Institute at UC Irvine. So that's going to be another uh, amazing experience where I'm going to help uh, the university uh, grow a um, integrative medicine program and um, work on the GI part of things for them. Boy, do you sleep at all? Speaking of sleep and integrative medicine, <laughs> young kids and, yep, and, yep. and a book is, and a podcast. And a, yeah, yeah. Um, sleep is my favorite activity. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Now you're valuing that above all else. So that's great. Um, so how, give us websites. Um, tell us how we can reach you. Um, and I love your podcast is amazing. Um, so I do encourage people to to listen to all the episodes. You have so many. So um, thank you. Yeah, my, that's my called precision, precision, yeah, podcast. precision, the health cast and precisions with an E. And I, I pre specifically spelled it that way because uh, precision. It's, the, it's the it's the Italian way. So I think you really say precisione if you really wanted to say it. But awesome. uh, I like with the E because that you can it's a little play on words because it ends in O N E. So one, it's all about you, the one person. And uh, my website is precisionclinic.com, precision with an E. I also have a website, drmarvinsingh.com. And uh, on social media, I'm at Dr. Marvin Singh. I'm pretty active on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, all of those. Um, and our podcast is called Precision the Healthcast. It's also found on my website, but on all the major podcast platforms that everybody likes listening on. Well, I'll tell you, it was so fun to catch up with you. It's been a little while, and I know we're, we're kind of watching each other's lives and careers move along. Um, so thank you for spending some time with us instead of sleeping or working. <laughs> um, so it was a joy and a pleasure. So um, I will post this on the Smart Human podcast when we launch, and I'm very excited about it. So thank you, Marvin. Dr. Marvin Singh, integrative medicine and functional medicine uh, gastroenterologist, one of just, I would say, less than, what, a couple in the country? Um, yep. Thank you for joining us and sharing all your wisdom. And it was a real pleasure. Stay safe and well with you and your family. Thank you. You too.